All right, we've got quite a few things to explore around the future of abortion in Michigan. I want to begin with the legal path, and to do that, we're going to start with the former Chief Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court, Marilyn Kelly. Justice Kelly, we don't get to hear uh, near often enough uh, to my way of thinking from former justices, so I'm really grateful for you being here today. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want, I'm really, I want to get to, we'll get to the legal stuff in a minute, but I first have to hear your reaction when you found out that this draft opinion had been released in an extraordinary leak that just doesn't happen. You've got it, an extraordinary leak, and I was shocked. Yeah. I've never seen it happen. In the 50 years I've been in the law, I've never seen an opinion leaked from the Supreme Court. Or at the state level, I would assume, of this, of, on a magnitude of this decision. True. I, I once saw in the Court of Appeals uh, a commissioner's report or a, 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 an attorney's report leaked. Um, but that was like 1989, a long time ago. Yeah. Um, do you think it damages the credibility of not just maybe the decision, but the court in general moving forward? Well, it, yes, I think that it throws in question just how, how what is happening and, and uh, how much confusion and tumult there might be going on at the United yeah, States Supreme Court yeah. right now. Well, let, let's let's talk then about what's happening. We, we every, Almost everybody knows, I think, now that Michigan, if Roe versus, if this does hold, Roe versus Wade is overturned, Michigan returns to a 1931 law that some have described as very archaic, and yet you were telling me earlier it's based on a, on a law that's even uh, uh, almost 100 years older than that. Right, 1846. And so the the, the law against abortion has existed in Michigan a long time. It has. Um, this is what some people refer to as a zombie law. It, it <laughs> never, it, in fact, I did the math. It will have been on the books longer um, unenforced than it was on the books when it was being enforced. How much relevance um, does a law like that uh, then suddenly come back? I guess what I'm asking you is what kind of argument does the governor and the attorney general have when they're saying that this law is A, in violation of the state constitution, and B, so arcane? Well, it's true, they have that argument. Uh, much has happened in the many, many decades that have passed since it, since it, was, uh, since it came down and went on the books in the legislature. Uh, and uh, it's, it's sure that if we have a constitution that's alive and living, that it would, it, it, an interpretation of it would affect the validity of that 1931 law. We have a very unusual situation in Michigan. I don't believe this exists in, in most other states. The governor can kind of hopscotch a lot of lower courts and take, if, if there's an urgency enough, and I think she can argue that there's certainly urgency around this, um, and goes direct, directly to the Supreme Court. It's unusual, isn't it? It is unusual. It's an executive power that the governor has, but most of us are unaware that she has it because we don't see the governor exercising it. But here we have an extraordinary situation, and she's doing an interesting thing. She's stepping up and saying, this, this, this legal matter must be decided, and I, as chief executive here in the state of Michigan, am going to see to it that it does get decided, and she's asked the Michigan Supreme Court to take it on. Um, if, if you were sitting on the court right now, does she have the grounds that this is something that the Supreme Court should take on, decision of what it would be aside? Right. Good question, because it's an easy yes. That's th part of the role of the Michigan Supreme Court and all Supreme Courts, is to make decisions about matters of public, great public interest and importance that affect uh, the community, the whole society, in a massive way. And uh, for those matters, the Supreme Court should step in and make a decision because in any event a decision by a lower court would have to go up to that court yeah. and so it's a waste of everybody's time and effort to go through the procedures to bring it all the way up and get it decided. Fine. So you would expect that they will take uh, it on? It certainly seems that yeah. that's a strong argument. <laughs> the other thing here that's really interesting is that if mo in most cases, if someone was challenging a law in the state of Michigan, we would expect the attorney general to defend that law on behalf of the state. Well, the attorney general has already signed on to the governor's case. Whose responsibility is it then to defend the 1931 law? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, it's, I think the attorney general is making a point. Uh, to us all when she tells us that she believes this should not be defended by the person who's the top attorney in the state. 
there's clearly an advocacy role that she's taking <laughs> on. It's true. Um, does that change the standing? I, I, I suppose she could create, you know, one of those legal walls, and her office could still somehow. Um, I, I wouldn't. Exp I don't know that I would expect her to do that, given her remarks on this so far. But does it change then? the likelihood of the law being able to stand if the state itself doesn't stand behind it. It seems likely that some somebody will will oppose it, but it's not clear. Not clear who yet. The, other, the last thing I wanted to ask you is about this group of prosecutors who have told us that they are not going to enforce the law. Now, there you can go on the Internet and find all kinds of really weird old laws that nobody enforces. I think in, uh, some, in one state it's illegal to walk your alligator without a leash or something weird like that. That's right. We hear about those things all the time. This is very different. This is to different. say, I am not going to enforce a law that is, this is very much going to be uh, in dispute and in debate. How do you feel about prosecutors saying that they will not enforce the laws of the state? It's an interesting question and clearly on its face and your initial reaction is that there's something wrong if a prosecutor is not enforcing the law. But if you look beyond that you realize that these prosecutors are sensing the public the public feeling about this mm -hmm. and we know from from uh, 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 surveys that have been done, and one of them by WDIV, I believe, in conjunction with the, with the Detroit News, right. just this year, uh, that shows a great majority of the people, two thirds or more of, of the voters in Michigan, uh, do not want to see Roe v. Wade overturned and do not want to see the trigger law, the 1931 law, reactivated in Michigan. And yet, I don't expect my judges to be too um, concerned about public opinion, or must they be? Well, they certainly need to be apart from public opinion so as to be objective, yeah, it's true. Yeah. And in this, in this draft opinion that's been leaked, the Supreme Court makes it very clear that uh, they will not be influenced by public outrage over it, even if there is massive public outrage. Boy, there's plenty of that. <laughs> Just, it's so good to have you here. Thank you very much for coming in and talking to me. Thank about you. It. It's my